What's up, everybody? I'm Thomas J. Beleza. Welcome to another session on The Right Mindset. Today, as you can see on the screen, we are going to go over the next step in writing a novel. Step 10, crafting your third draft for success. Now, uh, what goes into step 10 of writing a novel and crafting your third draft? Eh, this is the stage that I like to consider the polishing and refining phase, uh, where we basically take uh, our raw gem of a story and we shape it into a sparkling a jewel. So I'm going to show you uh, what a third draft really means, why it's crucial to your narrative, and how to elevate your writing. So let's do it. Let's get that uh, intro going and start the show. We're trying a little quicker today. We're seeing if it works, you know, uh, maybe keep the show going. Well, let's start with section one, understanding the purpose of a third draft. All right. Uh, before we dive into the nitty gritty details, uh, let's take a moment to understand the significance of the third draft. Now, this phase is where your story truly begins to shine, but it's not just about polishing the surface. It's about diving deep, addressing structural issues and elevating the narrative to new heights. I mean, that's the goal, right? One crucial aspect of this draft is incorporating the feedback from your alpha readers whom you consulted with in step nine. Now, they should have provided valuable insight into your story, pointing out what works and what needs improvement. The third draft is where you take their feedback to heart, using it as a compass to guide your revisions. In essence, the third draft is the bridge between your initial creative burst and the refined masterpiece you have envisioned. It's where the raw material of your storytelling gets molded into a cohesive, impactful narrative. <clears throat> now. Now, the essence of a, uh, a third draft. OK, uh, at its core, the third draft is about refinement and transformation. It marks the point in your writing journey where you transition from crafting the rough skeleton of your story to shaping it into a work of art. It's where your storytelling skills shine and your narrative takes on a life of its own. So why does the third draft matter? You know, one of the primary reasons the third draft is pivotal is because it's where you incorporate feedback from your alpha readers. These early readers provide fresh perspectives, pointing out strengths and weaknesses in your manuscript. By heeding their insights, you have the opportunity to elevate your story to new heights. Now, keep in mind, alpha readers are not beta readers. Alpha readers are there for the technical element of your writing, and beta readers are there for the reader's experience of your writing. Uh, so the alpha readers, a lot of their answers should come down to, was the pacing a little off? Did they feel that the arcs of the characters really elevated and changed over the times? Do they feel characters are being consistent to their voices that you've established? Uh, do they know what the plot is? <laughs> and does the plot make sense? Are there things that came up that weren't resolved? And that's ultimately what uh, your alpha reader should be doing. <clears throat> Now, number two, the initial drafts focus on getting your story down on paper, tackling major plot points and character development. However, the third draft allows you to dig deeper. It's a phase for identifying and rectifying deeper structural issues such as pacing problems, plot holes, inconsistencies, and character arcs that may have been overlooked in earlier drafts. So you have to look at your story and the alpha notes and just in general, when you do your read through, because again, as we know, as writers, there's a lot of rereading and rewriting, right? <clears throat> so when you're doing it, you should mark down the plot points and character developments. This is an easy way to kind of keep track of what you're doing. So if you're reading your script, your uh, novel, and in the novel it says, uh, you know, Melissa, uh, Melissa met Jacob uh, at the deli. You might write down that as a plot point. That first, you know, the relationship between Jacob and Melissa. Uh, they first met in chapter one uh, at the deli. 
and maybe some notes of what they, you know, what the conversation might have been like. Uh, if there's a secondary plot that happens, you know, keep track of that as you see elements for that plot to push forward. If there are positions of the characters being challenged, it's good to keep track of that. Ha was I consistent with this position? Did that position change? Uh, did they uh, is it slightly change or completely change? So it's good to keep track of that. If you do present the position of a character to see their arc grow, uh, you want to see if that position keeps getting challenged throughout the novel. If it doesn't, you might want to incorporate it a little bit more. If it's not that big of a position, meaning like, you know, they always drink Diet Cherry Pepsi. Mm. That might not be as important as, say, their position on uh, Melissa gets pregnant. Uh, they're not uh, in a relationship or married, but she comes back and says, hey, uh, I don't want to keep the baby. And maybe he's like, I do. I, I think you should keep the baby or maybe it's vice versa. She she doesn't want to. Uh, she wants to keep the baby, but he doesn't think she should keep the baby. Those are major positions. If they only come up once <laughs> for some reason, you missed it over the course of 27 chapters or more. You might want to say to yourself, why am I not maintaining this conversation in there? You know, because that eventually like, someone's going to have to budge or not budge, but it should at least come up again. That, that'll happen with with sometimes when uh, uh, I work with authors and they do like chapter work or a scene work, they'll create a scene or a chapter just to establish like one thing. You know, they'll be like, I need this chapter because I need people to know that this character is a good person. And it's like, no, make them good through the entire novel. And that would show that they are a good person. If, if you're just making a chapter to show they are good. That's probably not going to be a strong chapter. Another thing is the third draft, number three, the third draft uh, is also a testament to your growth as a writer. It's the stage where you refine your writing style, paying meticulous attention to sentence structure, word choice, and overall clarity. Uh, well, um, this is where you would basically eliminate, uh, eliminate unnecessary words, enhance your imagery where and when you feel necessary, and ensure a consistent voice and tone throughout the manuscript. During this stage, this is usually where I say to myself, does this sound like me? Am I, is, is it too straight? Is it too loose? Uh, <clears throat> is it too purpley? Is it not purpley enough? Um, did I incorporate enough sensory elements to immerse the reader? Not that you have to ask yourself these questions. I'm just saying these are things I ask myself. I might even say, uh, do I feel like they're talking too on the nose? Uh, should I extend it and add some more subtext? Uh, is the subtext too vague? Right? So this is where I start doing that. The other thing is I look at sentences and I go, uh, am I following a lot of the grammar rules? But more importantly, uh, are, the sentences, are the sentences too long or too short? etc etc all right so number four you know by focusing on the third draft you're ultimately enhancing the reader experience for your audience this is where you're striving to create a story that flows seamlessly immerses uh readers in its world and resonates on an emotional level this is where your narrative truly comes alive to life you have to say to yourself uh self <clears throat> do I feel like I'm in here or do I feel like I'm reading a story or do I feel like I'm being told a story? If you feel you're being told a story, you're probably telling more than you are showing. Uh, in reality, uh, you know, a, a strong narrative feels like you're in it, right? That immer everyone talks about immersion, 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 right? So if you feel you're being talked at, through the novel, like the novel's kind of like informing you, but you're not experiencing it through the characters or even your own self, uh, you might realize that you're, you need to kind of like work on the story a little bit and allow it to be less of an at conversation and allow it to be more of a with conversation with your reader. Uh, so, you know, a lot of these elements that you should be looking at is the experience as a reader yourself. I know you wrote it and you know a lot of stuff that's going on. And remember, we always talk about the writer bias. We know things that the audience will never know because we know these characters deeper than the page allows. Right. So you have to look at it like a reader and try to be unbiased and say to yourself, 
how am I experiencing this moment? Am I allowing it to breathe through me or do I feel like I'm reading a thesis? <laughs> but anyway, so, uh, you know, I also want you to know that the transformative power of being an author and getting a third draft go, you have to consider the third draft as the cocoon stage of your novel. You know, where the butterfly uh, or the caterpillar is in the cocoon, not the movie cocoon, but the caterpillar. Uh, your story has undergone significant changes since the first draft, and it's now poised for its final transformation into a beautiful butterfly. Mm, that's so cute. Uh, one might even say a polished draft. Mm -hmm captivating narrative that will uh you know get your readers excited in essence the third draft is about pushing the boundaries of your storytelling abilities it's about taking the raw material of your narrative and molding it into a cohesive impactful story so as you progress through this particular stage remember that it's not just about editing it's about elevating your writing to new heights it's more than saying this word is incorrect let me correct it it's more than saying this sentence is too long let me shorten it it's more than saying the sentence is too short let me longer make it longer <clears throat> you are looking at this draft and taking the alpha alpha reader notes plus your own perspective of it and enhancing the immersion enhancing the the clarity enhancing the experience and you want because it again of course we believe our books are great otherwise we wouldn't write it like why would we write a story we don't believe is great and of course we should believe in our writing but this is that time where we don't have a <clears throat> a critical eye where we like you know basically fall into a corner and uh i have many a times cried myself to sleep going my i can't write i'm a horrible writer that's not what we're trying to do here what we're trying to do is to just look at it and say to ourselves let me take in each page let me take in each scene let me take in each chapter and really breathe it in and allow it to uh, uh, fester in my mind and am i really experiencing this or just does it just feel like words on a page so that's the advantage of really giving yourself some time to transform this draft. Section two. Polishing and elevating. boop a doo doo doop a doo Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, this is basically, a, you got to explore the intricate process of polishing and elevating your manuscript during the third draft. This phase is where your novel truly takes, uh, truly begins to shine and creates uh, uh, an opportunity for readers to dive in. Now, in the polishing and refining stage, uh, you'll address fundamental aspects of your manuscript that need fine tuning. So uh, this is sort of what the meticulousness would look like. All right, you, because your alpha readers may or may not see these things, but it is your job. Remember, every great writer has a great editor, but all great writing is rewriting. Does that mean you should rewrite your whole book? No. <clears throat> but sometimes you want to add and subtract in scenes. So <clears throat> I'm sorry. I've been getting over cold. I apologize. Well, the first draft, uh, uh, number one. Well, the first two drafts focus on getting your story down on the paper. The third draft is more where you roll up your sleeves and dive into the nitty gritty. So, um, Things you should really paying attention to when it comes to your structure and plot is uh, pacing uh, analysis, right? <clears throat> You'll evaluate the pacing of your story, ensuring it's neither rushed nor sluggish. Hmm? This involves pinpointing areas where readers might lose the interest. Real quick, what is uh, pacing? Pacing is the amount of information placed in front of the reader. So the more information that's placed in the reader, the slower it becomes, the less information, the quicker the read comes because uh, you're able to kind of process uh, less information more often throughout the read. But sometimes you do want to have a chunk of information pushed on them. So the way you chunk out information also influences the pacing. So it's, it's the speed at which the reader takes in information. Um, not that this is a pacing video, but a real quick example is <clears throat> one. Uh, okay, so let's do a romance novel. Uh, the guy is 
uh, running after uh, a taxi that uh, has the woman of his dreams, and she's about to, she's taking a taxi to the airport, and this is his last chance to profess his love. And he thought we're setting up the background. He thought there was no chance that it was over, uh, but he found out from his best friend uh, that she left a letter, um, and he read the letter, and now he's running to her. So the pacing should be quick. So we should get a lot of information uh, fairly quick. We should be like, you know, he's running down the street. He's avoiding traffic. He's looking for her taxi, uh, you know, and then we but then we can cut. We can control the pacing by cutting to her in the taxi. And she's just sitting there. She's in the ride. She maybe is reading a book. Uh, She could be looking at her phone, texting somebody. Right. She's just not aware of the of the, uh, the, the, the the tension that's building. Right. Will he won't he find a taxi and then we can cut back. And now he's rushing still. He knocks on one window. Oh, Claire, you know, whatever. Oh, no. All right. And then he's looking at, and he's looking at, and, he's stand, and then he stands up on all the taxis and then he sees her, you know, or her um, her. Maybe she has like dyed purple, pink hair or whatever, whatever. OK. And he's like, ah, and he's like running over to her. And then. He knocks on the window and she looks and she sees him. And th- this is all quick in the book. These are all quick sentences, quick moments, right? Because w- the information's flying at you. And then she rolls down the window and now you slow down the pace. You know, they looked into each other's eyes. The world paused. The honking of traffic disappeared as they took in the moment they both been yearning for. She unlocked the door, pushing it open and allowing him to step in. They embrace in a long, sensual kiss, their hearts beating as one, you know, whatever. And now the pacing slows down. So the information's coming at them a little slow. We're letting it breathe out. We're being a little bit more descriptive. We're allowing the, a little bit more play on the uh, on the purple prose prose. Anyway. Other things that uh, you should be trying to address during this uh, structural and plot issues is a plot hole that, uh, uh, you know, you, you have to your task here is to basically be like, is the plot happening? Is the plot making sense? Am I missing anything? Did something happen? Was it too contrived? Was it too unclear? Did I give away too much information too quickly? You know, because sometimes you don't want the reader to figure it out before the characters. And sometimes you want the characters to not figure it out before. uh, You want the readers to figure out first and then the characters figure out. So, you know, the readers are like sort of like rooting for them. So this comes back to that thing I was saying earlier is just as you're going through the chapters, write down the plot beats that are happening. Um, Now, everything that happens in the chapter might not necessarily be a plot beat. But, you know, if you're doing a thriller and they notice something on the rug and it's a uh, it's a small pin uh, with a with a symbol on it. Well, that would be the first clue discovered. And this is going to lead to blank, blank, blank. And now you read the book. And if it doesn't lead to that, you know that you're missing something. There's a plot hole now. So you have you have to keep track of that. Right. The other thing is character arcs. You know, you want to ensure that they undergo meaningful development. Uh, throughout your story. And again, you would look at character moments where their positions are challenged or presented. Are their positions, uh, after being challenged and presented, uh, are they slightly changed, completely changed, or not changed at all? You would keep note of that. What was the position that was challenged? Uh, Did it remain the same, not uh, slightly changed, or completely changed? And that's how you develop. And as they change, slightly change or completely change, you would write down what is their new position and am I maintaining that clear new position? Because obviously if their position changed slightly or completely and then moving past that moment, it sort of sounds like they re- they reverted back to their old position, but we didn't see them regressing, I guess, uh, even though it could just be like maybe they just realized, though, maybe my original position was the right one. You know, we, we lose the character arc. So you want to keep track of that. But overall, the structure and the harmony of everything is to really create a seamless, cohesive narrative. You know, you want to check for structural issues like abrupt shifts in tone or setting. And you want to work to ensure a logical flow from start to finish. A really great uh, tip for this is when you're looking at a chapter or a scene, is there a clear beginning, middle and end? 
I have videos on what breaking a scene down and looking at what a clear middle uh, beginning, middle, and end are. They have purpose. A beginning has a very specific purpose. A middle has a very specific purpose. And an ending has a very specific purpose. So when you're looking at your acts, right, we talk about the 27 chapter, uh, the 27 plot point outline. Uh, each act is broken up into three sections. Each of those sections are broken up into three plot points. Therefore, there are nine plot points per act. So you can literally look at the beginning, middle, end of a story down to the micro. So you have this, you have the scene, you have the chapter, right? And then you have the plot point, then you have the sections, and then you have the acts, and boom, right? So when you're looking at structural harmony and making sure that everything is working and smoothly going into each other and the tones there and the settings are clear, you might say to yourself, you know, um, when I set up the, uh, the ordinary world, did I maintain clarity? Uh, you know, when I set up the disruption of the world, did I maintain clarity? You know, like you want to look at each moment and say to yourself, how is this flowing into the next beat? And does it flow into it seamlessly or does it feel abrupt or unearned? Right. Okay. Strengths, strengths, strengthening pros and styles. Number two, uh, with, with the structural elements in place, it's time to refine your writing on a more grand rule level. Sentence structure. You want it? Now, by the way, I'm not talking about line editing or uh, or copy editing because you should be hiring someone for that. But you could do your own personal work for your voice as a writer. And that would come down to sentence structure or word choices. So sentence structure might be like, you know, the length, the clarity or the rhythm. Right. I use a very poetic style of writing uh, because I come from music and lyrics and poetry, but I'm not purpley. I have purple moments, but I like to have like, since it's fantasy, I like to have that kind of almost uh, fantastical way of the, of the, of the, uh, the narrative and the word choices, right? Uh, the other thing is when it comes to your word choices, you know, you got to choose what words you want and you want to try to avoid cliches and explore fresh, vivid descriptions. Her, uh, her eyes were the sun. And I, the moon, like, you know, it's terrible, right? Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, whatever you, you want to, you want to try to avoid the cliches. Um, so when you look at words, here's a, here's a good tip. That was, I, this is what it was given to me when I was a young writer. Uh, <laughs> um, it, if you're writing in first person, the narrative should be written through the perspective of whoever, the POV is. So if I am the first person POV, the narrative itself would be written in my voice too. If it's third person limited, the narrative has a different voice than the characters. Okay. If it's third person omniscient, the narrative has its own voice and personality. It is an entity. It is omniscient it is a de deity ultimately it's looking and knowing everything so you can give it personality so when you're writing you have to think of yourself <clears throat> as each of these characters the characters you're writing the narrative you're writing the if it's limited or an omniscient or if it's pov of first person right and you have to say to yourself do these words match these personalities that's something you have to really explore and, uh, you know, also uh, voice and tone is important. You got to maintain consistency with your voice and tone. So if it's uh, reflective, make sure that you're creating reflective tone. Uh, you can switch tones within a scene, but you kind of want to make sure that it shifts through the mood and not necessarily like, let's be thoughtful. And then the next thing is action and impact, impact uh, <clears throat> without a smooth transition just a matter of gradually building or if you're going to do something abrupt you have to have that transitional sentence or transitional mood maybe a hard chapter break or a soft chapter break um all right number trace ensuring consistency and continuity <laughs> during the third draft you'll act as a detective searching for any inconsistencies right so again look for those continu continuity errors Look for character behavior and logical flow. 
Continuity errors, basically, you know, discrepancies with time, place, and character actions. Some characters have a behavior, and if that behavior is going above and beyond what they would do, or it doesn't seem like, why didn't they react, or they they didn't really, re- you know, I've been reading this for uh, 20 chapters, and they just did something that just, like, why would they do that, right? And you can't justify it by saying, well, I, I want them to do that. You have to make sure it's on the page, either subconsciously on the page or subtextually or somewhere. It has to be on the page. That choice needs to make sense. Now, if it's the first chapter or even the first five chapters, we're still getting to learn the characters. By chapter 20, though, your characters, they should be defined like their 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 choice making should be defined, you know, Uh and of course, logical flow, we, you know, the cause and effect, you know, you want to make sure that things are happening because of their reactions, right? Um, I talk about this often, you know, uh, sometimes lots of stuff is happening, but nothing is happening. And that's because there's no logical uh, choice being made. There's no consequences to those choices. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just like things, you know, oh, we got to go this way. All right, this thing has to happen. Oh, they need they need to find the the gem. They found the gem, but like, you know, like you're just they're not earning the gem, uh, you know, or uh, I like to do basically I like to challenge my characters. I like to put them into positions where they're being uh pushed through things. If they make a choice, right? Every choice a character makes, it, there has to be a consequence, good or bad. Whatever that consequence is, it's up to you. But there should be a consequence. There should be a result to it. Okay? If a character confesses their love and the other character denies it, there's a consequence. Good or bad. Good or bad. There's a consequence. Um, If someone... um, This is the other thing. Like, when characters... (laughs) Like, when... Like, young characters in stories, especially fantasy, like, they're 16 or 70, and they kill somebody... And they're just they just kill them and keep going. <laughs> and you're like, eh, there's a chance that emotionally uh, that might affect them. Unless, of course, you establish that they have no problem killing or that it they what they did was survival, you know, but there should still be a consequence, good or bad. There should be a reaction to it, a reflection. It's not like they're war veterans, you know, um, the first time a character uses magic, there's a consequence. Either it's going to be emotional, physical, mental, uh, spiritual. It's going to be environmental. You know, it's, it's like when people use magic in stories, it's just like, pew, and the first time someone sees it, they're like, oh, that's cool magic. And, no, this changes everything. <laughs> you're just you're just teleported. Now, all of our plots are affected. You know what I'm saying? Like anytime something happens, it changes the way the story works. So you want to make sure all that makes sense. Okay, elevating the narrative, all right? When you're going through your story, just make sure you're highlighting and heightening emotional impact, all right? Like I said, when certain things happen, you want to allow the characters to process the emotional truth of that moment and allow it to uh, challenge their positions, Um, you know? The way it moves their relationships for uh, those they know, strangers, the world around them, themselves, loved ones, etc. You have to allow your characters to move through those emotions. Things can't just happen and then they move on. I mean, they can. It's your story. You can do whatever you want, right? But when you're trying to build a rich character or an immersive world, allow things to affect the characters. Allow them to process stuff. Do they have to process it for eight eight chapters? No. They have to process it for eight pages. No, but they do need to process emotion either quietly, loudly, somewhat. Maybe it's something they work through throughout the novel. It has to be there. Emotions need to be present. The other thing is character motivations. You know, you want to elevate the narrative. Make sure the character motivations are clear, that their desires are true and that the conflicts to those desires are present. The midpoint conflict ultimately re- reveals the truth of the lie the protagonist believed. Their desire and motivations, right, 
are challenged in the midpoint conflict in the middle of your story and they learn the truth that they did not that they were ultimately believing a lie <clears throat> so how does that influence their motivations and of course relationship dynamics are an important thing to uh to play with without without that you have no characters characters are built on those they interact with and the world around them how they interact with people who are no name characters is just as important as how they interact with characters with names so keep that in mind uh you also want to uh add layers and depth so when you're playing with your third draft, think about the subtle details. Think about the thematics, you know, things that are important. Think about your themes. Uh, think about the emotional impact. Maybe you have a philosophical message you're trying to mention. Something I like to do in my novels is uh, I personally try not to present this is right perspective. I try to create a, uh, a, a multitude of perspectives on a subject or matter. And I allow the reader to either think about it or not think about it. It's I, I try not to make it so thick that it's like they're making me think about this. I like to have the moments move characters and have other characters kind of thinking about those things. And therefore, the reader uh, has the option because it's there to be like, oh, that is interesting. I, I never thought of it that way. Right. So it's good to add those things when you want. You don't have to. But sometimes you want to add some thematic elements or some philosophical uh, debates in there uh, through different character positions, because that's how you challenge character positions, too. So if one character believes that we should go to war because war will save the innocent and other people are like, yeah, but can we afford the deaths? Can we afford putting our citizens at risk because we have to put the money towards the troops, the soldiers? And a lot of our soldiers are younger. Now we're getting into the, you know, and that's philosophical debate. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, you want to polish up your uh, dialogue and character voices, making sure that character voices um, are consistent, that dialogue is natural, and that ultimately is contributing to the arcs of both the character and the plot. You don't want to have characters just talking to talk. Some people say, well, Quentin Tarantino does it, but he doesn't. Dialogue, as a narrative sentence, must do one or more of these elements. Plot, character development, or world building. If it doesn't do any of those three, one or more of those three things, it's fluff. Hey, how are you? I'm great. How's everything? Eh, it's going good. It's nice out. It is. Anyway, uh, did you bring that report I asked you for? <clears throat> Cut all that beginning out. Did you bring the report I was asking for? Oh, but I want the people to know that it's nice out. Well, make sure that... Uh... Hey, did you bring that report uh, I asked you for? Yeah, it took me a little bit. You know, with the nice day, I kind of... I, I, I took a little bit more time to walk. I'm sorry, I, I was slow. Now that's character development. And now we know it's a nice day. Because it's a choice, right? All right, before we get to the third section... Uh, to kind of go over uh, preparing for feedback with uh, your beta readers, which is going to come up soon. Uh, please subscribe, hit that bell icon uh, so you don't miss out. Uh, if you're new to the channel, but you like what you've been hearing, it'd be great. Uh, as you can see, uh, we do lessons on craft. We analyze and review storytelling. And I also do interviews with other fellow writers. If you yourself want to be interviewed, let me know in the comments below if you're an author. Uh, and you don't have to be published. You just have to be someone who writes, you know, an author is somebody who has authored work, even if it hasn't been published. It's just in the, you know, I, I author work, uh, but writers are writers. People are writers, right? If they write. Okay. Preparing for feedback with the beta readers. All right, here we go. Here we go. <clears throat> you gotta have your beta readers. Okay. So, uh, all right your goal with this is this is your third draft <clears throat> all right so you're taking the alpha reader notes you're going through it as an unbiased uh 
self editor to kind of go, let me clean this up. Let me make it more immersive. Let me pull out my voice a little bit more. Let me make sure everything's making sense. But you also want to make sure that it's clear and that the, the dialogue is good. Uh, you want to proofread it. You're not going to get everything. You're not. But you can just do a proofread. You could do a consistency check. Make sure everything is clear and coherent, you know. Uh, and then ultimately, when you feel you have that book uh, where it should be, uh, you know that it's going to be ready for uh, your beta readers, which is which is always a, a good thing, you know, because uh, that is that's going to be the next step is beta readers, right? Because after you finish your third draft, uh, you got you got to make sure that's right. So, with that said, um, let's talk about a couple of things. Uh, that you should be doing for the beta reader. So before you, you know, these are the things you should be looking at before you go into the next step. Okay. So you want to, uh, you want to aim for a diverse group of beta readers who can offer different perspectives and insight. This may include avid readers, writers, or individuals with ex expertise in relevant fields. Um, you want to make sure that you know what your clear instructions to those beta readers will be. Uh, you know, what kind of feedback are you looking for on plot, character development, pacing, etc.? You have to figure this out before you ask any beta readers. Uh, but look at your book and and hone your your interests to the book. So if there's specific things that you're looking for and that you want people to personally relate to, make sure that's in your questions uh and also figure out your timeline you know how how long do you want people to be reading this book if it's if it's a if it's a chapter a week and uh you know you got 60 chapters you know that that's going to take 60 weeks so that's uh it's a long time <laughs> that's a real long time anyway all right final thoughts Let's do the final thoughts. Okay. In the ever, uh, the ever evolving landscape of writer's journey, there's a fundamental truth that cannot be ignored to improve as a writer. We must work on our craft beyond the pages of our novels. The third draft isn't just a mere editing phase. It's a vital part of honing our storytelling skills. Remember writing isn't solely about writing. It's about deliberate practice, continuous improvement and unwavering dedication to our craft. So embrace the art of isolated practice sessions, refine your skills and stay committed to your writing journey with determination and relentless pursuit of improvement. You can transform your writing journey into a fulfilling and successful career. So my point to you is take this step, your alpha Rita step, uh, your, your third draft using alpha readers. And you have to say to yourself, you know what? This isn't going to be like my last book. So practice, what it is you need to be doing in the third draft. Practice identifying missing elements. Practice immersion. I talk about this in other videos where it's, uh, I'll take a situation, like let's say just me going to get my mail outside. I will write it completely in smell, completely in sight, completely in what I hear, completely in the taste or the ideas. And then so then I have, you know, obviously several moments, right? Uh, a lot of people say there's uh, five senses. I say there's six because you have to involve time. Time is a sense, the sense of time, movement. Uh, and then I look at that and I say, all right, you know, and I use that as a practice. And then I could look at my third draft and say, do I have immersive senses in here? And I know what I can do and where I can do it and why I can do it. So practice even when you're not writing and learn the skills needed to do the third draft properly. This also includes understanding how to take alpha reader notes and utilizing them with an open mind. Next video in the series uh, is going to focus on step 11, beta readers, what to gain from them. All right, so I'll, we'll talk about a few things about uh, what kind of questions they ask beta readers, uh, the difference between the alpha reader and the beta reader. Like I've already said, alpha readers focus on the more technical elements, whereas the beta readers focus more on the emotional reader experience. Okay. But so we'll, we'll talk about that. Question. How do you organize your writing process out? Let us know in the comments.
below. If you like what you've watched and you haven't done so already, please subscribe and hit that bell icon so you don't miss out. As always, keep developing the right mindset. Boo! I'll see you next time. Much love!